How's it going? Second talk. <laughs> Decrease your conversion common ways. How loud do I have to speak for the back? Is that all right? Yeah, loud. <laughs> okay. I always lost my, my voice yesterday, so let's, let's see how this goes. Decrease your conversion. Common ways to lock people out. Let me quickly introduce myself. Hey! Oh, I have to press play first. Wait. I'm Stefan. Sometimes I look like that. So there's this thing going on which is called onesie jazz. So if you have a onesie and you're going to a conference, you can do a lot of cuddling, make new friends. It's a pretty nice thing. I'm a front-end developer, occasional teacher, I'm organizing the web performance meetup, and I did this Ellie Club thing that was mentioned already, and I'm extremely happy that this is happening here right now. So thanks to the organizers. I think, that, I think that's really, really cool. And my main interest is in open source web performance and accessibility, and I work for this company that is called Contentful. So basically a content management infrastructure in the cloud, and I'm a front-end developer by heart, so when you don't want to set up your database and your infrastructure to just get a little bit of JSON and a nice editor for non-technical people, then you can give Contentful a try, and then you've got to have an, an API, and can give editors at a CMS. So I always say with Contentful, editors get a CMS and developers don't actually have to work with one. And last exciting news, two and a half weeks and we're doing this, Global Diversity CFP Day. So I think that we need a more diverse group or more diverse lineup in the tech industry and we need less people that look like me and more people that are a little bit different. That's why we um, do a worldwide event where we want to help people to write good CFPs and give advice on talks. And it's happening on the 3rd of February in Berlin. And everybody is an expert in something, right? So maybe someone wants to speak at some point. So decrease your conversion. When I started working in web dev, I ended up in one of these teams, conversion rate optimization. And it was actually in this building because I used to work for Project A. And the usual e-commerce conversion rate is 2 to 3% to making an actual order. This means that tiny, tiny improvements actually mean something, right? When you improve your conversion rate by 0.1% and your Amazon, then you're making a gazillion more money. And this is why we're spending ages on optimizing and we're A-B testing the heck out of everything. But what actually leads to decision? of the conversion of buying or of using a product. Is it the button color? Is it timing? Is it the mood of the person? Or when you're, who's working in e-commerce? Or worked in e-commerce? Very often it just depends on the weather. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, it's important to optimize. We have to understand our users. And what I want to tell you in the next 30, it's more 40, uh, uh, what, what we have to consider is more than color text and features. Because maybe there is more than in the actual product. Because at the end, we're dealing with people. And people care about web performance, inclusive design, and accessibility. And these are three topics close to my heart. And they're big topics, so let's see how this goes. So web performance first. I have to say, I live in a bubble. And look at that, that's a healthy bubble. I've got a heavily expensive phone, EU-wide data fast, um, a computer that is so expensive that we don't want to talk about that. And we all have to admit that we or I, we are not the baseline. We have to ask ourselves, okay, where will our next customer come from? Because maybe we're building the next Twitter. So what are the top 10 countries with the most internet users? China, India, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the most internet users actually come from, from China with 730 million people, followed by India, USA, Brazil. And fun fact about this numbers, these numbers is that according to MIT, 90% of the 330 million people from China use their mobile device as primary source. And you know what it is, not everywhere is Wi-Fi. Right? And when you consider how much money people actually pay for data, you see that there are different things. So for example, in Finland, people get um, for 35 euros 
an unlimited amount of data. And when we look at Germany, this is based on a prepaid plan, we get four gigabyte, maybe five for 35 euros. This means that people pay different amounts of money for access to data. This is really interesting. And Tim Cutlex thought the same, and he bought a product around this. So what you see here is what does my site cost? And what you can do there is put a website in, and it gives you how much money an actual website cost in the given country. And then it compares it to the um, local incomes of, of these countries. And then you can actually see that web performance makes a difference. So no, 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 let's write up the result. When you can tell that one visit of your website is 5 or 10 percent of the daily income of this person, it might matter that you optimize some things. So let's do a little bit of math here. So I've got this blue mobile provider, and you can get a prepaid plan there, of one gigabyte for 10 euros. This means that I can access a website with 2.5 meg, 400 chimes. And I'm ignoring caching headers, and this is on purpose. This means that one visit costs me two cents. Think of that, right out of my pocket. And what are we spending the money for? So images are 65% of the overall traffic of the internet. And I see a lot of people smiling when I mention these kind of things, but image is not equal image, right? We have different image formats. We have GIFs, JPEGs, PNG, SVGs. So when should we use which? So if it is a vector graphic, let's please all finally jump on the SVG train. Otherwise, go with a GIF, PNG, or JPEG. Do you need fine detail, high resolution, or transparency? then maybe PNG is an option. How many colors do you need? There's PNG 4 and PNG 8. And otherwise, go with JPEG. So I looked around and browsed the internet, and I found this image. And I found this in a blog post. And this image will come back a few times in this talk. So but how much actually does this image cost? As a GIF, one cent. OK. PNG 8, almost one cent. PNG 24. Three cents right out of my pocket. And then we've got JPEG, quality 65, half a cent. OK, I think this is really cool. We have also exotic image formats, JPEG XR, WebP, JPEG 2000, Flip, BPG. Now we're entering cross-browser land. OK, so JPEG XR, Microsoft Universe, WebP, Google Universe, JPEG 2000, Apple Universe. In my opinion, only WebP is kind of entering the web industry, but yeah. So WebP goes down to a tenth of a cent. I think this is really cool. If you want to go that route, you can use the picture element today and feature detect if the browser supports this kind of image format. And then you can save money for your users. Or if you're more a server-side person, you can also read out the um, accept header. And you can serve it by server-side um, um, HD access config. But maybe. JPEG is good enough. There are also different JPEG encoders. So there's libjpeg, mozjpeg, and Gootsly. And these are all available um, to put them in image optim in your build process. And then you can automate that away. So the same image with libjpeg, half a cent. Gootsly, OK, getting a little bit better. But then we have mozjpeg, which cuts it in half again. And when you have this set up, the cost of that is nothing. If you're interested in more information about these kind of th things, Yuna Kravitz gave an excellent talk that was called The Job of Optimizing. Highly recommend it. So I found this image in a blog post. And this was the blog post. And then and I anonymized it a little bit. So the whole website was 25 meg on desktop and 30 meg on a mobile connection. I didn't debug what was going on there and what, I mean, what? So where is this page break coming from? And look at the numbers. That's 20 and 30 cents. I always have coins in my pocket, but these would disappear. So we had these few images. The background image plus three images of code. I already don't know how I think about images of code. And none of them was responsive. All of them were 2,000 pixels wide. And we have responsive images today. We can use the source data attribute, and we can save bytes on the wire. And there's no JavaScript needed for that. And maybe you have a, a server-side resizing service in place, then you don't even have to resize them yourself. This is really, really easy. So I optimized all the images, and I went for JPEGs, and I got down to 170K. Again, almost nothing. But now you could do the math. 
Yeah, but Stefan, you talked about 30, 30 meg. So where's the rest? The rest is this. A GIF. 24 megabytes. 24 cents. About code. I'm still not sure how I feel about that. So this is kind of video, right? The average video response size today is 500K. Videos are only embedded in 7% of the overall internet usage, but if they come into play, they matter. So on my private website, what I do is I collect all the learnings and all the stuff, and I write about that really quickly. And I started out with GIFs, right? Because this is what the internet is about. GIFs and cats and all these kind of things. And then I switched it to MPEG-4, and I saved 10 megabytes. And then I went the next step, and I uh, uh, co compressed the MPEG, excuse me, MPEG-4, and I could save a little bit more data on the wire then. But maybe there's even a better format for video today. We also have WebM, which is built for the web, which is even smaller. So then we can use the video element, and the browser again goes from top to bottom and, bottom and uses the format it understands. So with the, these three options, so MPEG-4, optimized MPEG-4, and WebM, I got down from f five cents to half a cent. Another few coins saved in my pocket. And then I automated it away and put it in my dot files. And all the time when I'm now dealing with video, I just call one command, upload it, done. Really, really cool. But when you're dealing with video, what I want, also want to tell you is, let's please use video responsibly. Years ago, I was lucky and I recorded this thing here. So what you see here is two newspapers, New York Times and The Guardian, and I, wait, bam. I don't want to know what Audi paid for that ad on the homepage of the New York Times. But on the other side, I don't want to know what all the people on the other end paid for that ad. And nobody asked for that. So in the last missing piece, what about text? Dealing with text, we should follow best practices. We should always minify and compress. Right, gzip all the things. But there's also a new compression algorithm, which is called Broadly, um, where you can squeeze a little bit more data that doesn't have to go over the wire then. Broadly has a few gotchas, though. Doesn't work on, does only work on HTTPS. And the encoding is really slow. So you cannot do it on, ha um, on the fly, like with gzip. So this means that you have to encode it in your build processes and then serve it statically. But yeah, maybe you want to save that. Big companies like Facebook, Dropbox, all these companies ship broadly today. So web performance on its own is a huge topic. We can talk about fonts, HTTP2, progressive web apps, buzzword, cache, rail, time to interactive. I decided to cover three big topics here, so I have to move on. If you want to learn more about front-end web performance, um, Radimir and I and a few friends are maintaining this online resource about front-end web performance called Perf Tooling Today. So usually you find all relevant um, front-end web performing stuff um, collected there. So when you're not caring about web performance, what you usually do is you lock people out that live in less populated areas. When I'm visiting my parents in the middle of nowhere in North Germany, I cannot even use my phone because the mobile connection is that bad. You're locking people out that are not able to um, afford expensive plans. And you're locking people out that maybe are maybe on conference Wi-Fi or are in a foreign country. I was in Laos four days ago, still jack -lagged. Um There I pay six euros for two megabytes. How far do I come with that? We always have to remember ourselves that information shouldn't be a privilege. And I consider myself to be a web professional and I want to, want to make the internet more affordable and more accessible. If this is not enough, and you need to convince someone with stuff like that, like big company ABC increased some conversion rate or saved some money or is getting richer because of that. Tim Cadillac and Tammy Everts are collecting exactly these arguments for your next discussion on a website that is called WPO Stats, so you can check that out. So let's step back a little bit. In the United States, there are 57 million people with disability. with the disabilities. And the fact about these people is that 70% of these people will leave your site and your product when it's difficult to use. 
In the UK, there are 6.1 million people that have a sort of impairment, and these people will spend 16 billion pounds online um, this year. If 70% of these people decide to go, is this maybe part of your conversion rate? Maybe. And this brings me to the next topic, inclusive design. Inclusive design, yes! <laughs> Inclusive design is a design methodology that enables and draws on the full range of human diversity. And diversity is great and it's beautiful. So let me just tell you a story from, from an event in, in London. And that happened actually to me last year. So I was uh, giving a talk there and I got this device. Oh, I've got a similar thing here. So and this thing has a mute button. And the sound engineer came over and was like, hey, you can mute this thing the tiny little green thing there. And you probably can see when it's muted because then it's switching to red, but I cannot. Hmm. And when you start looking around these things, you will see them over and over and over again. One of 12 men has a sort of color blindness. For women, it's one of 200. So let's have a look at this beautiful image here. Subima, I guess this looks good to me. But who knows? But it could also look for some people like that, like that, or like that. Do you consider color in your products? This graph, we all do database and single page apps and React and Angular and all this stuff, right? This could look like that and look, look like that. We cannot um, convey all the information via color only. And to check for that is actually not that hard. So there's this awesome Chrome extension that is called Funkify. And what this gives you is personas with different um, disabilities. So you can check for color blindness easily with something like that. But also it gives you personas for um, people with visual impairment, for people with dyslexia, or for people that have a motor impairment. Are your products still usable? Definitely play around with that. I think that, that is a really, really nice Chrome extension. So in a year ago, before I joined Contentful, uh, my boss was like, Stefan, before you join Contentful, you have to bring your website in order. It looks like crap right now. And he, he's, he uses strong language, so he really said it looks like crap. So, and I'm a developer, and I asked a designer, so hey, can you, I have to redesign my site. And this is what a friend came up with, and was like, yeah, <laughs> looks good to me. I don't care that much, to be honest. And there's a blog section in there, and what happens when you write an article about accessibility? The internet screams at you that your blog is inaccessible. And Hayden was right. The initial blog design has several flaws. And there were problems with uh, font sizes and contrasts all over the place. And I didn't take care of that. And checking for font sizes and color contrast, for example, is easily automatable. So what you see there is the X project. You can put this next to your unit test suite and check your product if it is still accessible. <coughs> and there are several products out there. So there's Tenon, there's AC Checker X, the Wave project. And this link there gives you a really nice comparison of when to use what. And also, Google, for example, is also pushing towards accessibility. So we are, when you're doing progressive web apps, right, you might have noticed there's now an accessibility audit in there. And this ships with the X project. So Google kind of thinks accessibility is important too. Speaking of Google, I did a redesign recently. So um, speaking of Google, accessibility stuff is also on the DevTools. There is now this accessibility panel where you can access the accessibility tree, which is kind of par in parallel to the DOM tree. But also you see what will be uh, read out loud when you use a screen reader or something like that. This is really, really cool. But maybe you say this is a little bit too late because now it already hit development, right? Maybe we can give our developers tools like that. So what you see here is a sketch plugin which tells you when the contrast ratio is not high enough. And maybe this is also a little bit too late. So maybe we can just use tools like that. So what you see there is colorable where you can put in all your branding, CI and whatever colors and then it will just tell you these colors are cool to use with each other. And when you work in the front end, you know how it goes, right? We don't need 50 shades of gray. So this is really welcome. 
So at the end, I fixed all the issues, and I have to say that it's looks pretty, at least to me. But at the end, more people can read my articles, and because and that's the whole purpose of me sitting down on a Sunday writing an article, right? Let me tell you another story from the same event. So we wanted to live stream audio, and the speaker after me, she was like, hmm. No, so the event was live streamed, and she wanted to play audio. And the same technician came, mm, I'm not sure if that's possible. The problem there was that she was relying on sound only. And last year I was, for example, attending the View Source conference for the first time. And what I did, and you see this there on the side, is that all the conference talks were um, with live transcriptions. And this is not only for deaf people. When I have to listen to a person from New Zealand, oh, oh well. <laughs> That, that, that is really, really hard. This can save also my experience. And later on, they also ship the products with um, captions and the live videos. <coughs> but it's not only about consuming content, right? There are guidelines on how big the interaction elements should be. Who wouldn't <laughs> catch buying a train ticket and running on the same time? That happens to me constantly. Why is that? Because the button is 10, equal, uh, 10 multiplied by 15 pixels. So when we're not thinking of these kind of things, we're locking people out that can't turn on sound, right? Um, captioning helps me when I want to uh, watch a video on the public transport and I forgot my headphones. When I'm sitting in the sunlight, contrast, matter, contrast ratio matters to me. Or maybe you cannot pull, pay full attention and you're just doing something else and want to press a button, then it should be big enough and should be readable. We have to all think of all the possibilities. And let's please, as developers, let's stop doing that. Well, it's the design. No, it's not. It is a lot of people working together. And designing products is not only about making them pretty. And I, we, I, I'm not only a pixel pusher anymore, right? I'm front end developers today are information architects, and we should all think about that. At the end, it boils down to education, collaboration, and being inclusive. When I broke my right arm, this matters. Sunglasses matter. And this all um, affects the success of your product. Recently, there was a tweet by Safiya Abtala, and she asked the Twitter sphere, if you have a disability, what's the hardest thing about browsing the web? This tweet got 1.6K retweets. And the most answers were lack of captioning, color problems, too small uh, touch targets, and distracting animations. In America, we've got 69 million people with something that is called vestibular disorder. This is caused by problems affecting the inner ear. And what this basically means that is that movement that you're not expecting or something, just general movement, can make you feel dizzy and sick. And Apple is actually doing a pretty good job helping these kind of people because iOS has this little setting here, reduce motion. And you can detect this in your CSS and your JavaScript using a media query or match media, and then you can adjust your interfaces to not make people sick, right? You have to think of that. We're building products to not make people sick. So an Apple then released their own products, right? So what you see here is a slight movement when you hover things. And when you have reduced motion turn on, they just skip it, which is really, really cool. And then who remembers the Sierra release? So this was the landing page for that. And I don't know if I have something like that, but that even makes me dizzy. So when you have reduced motion turned on, it looks like that. I think this is really, really nice. And this is three, four lines of, of CSS, which is just if reduced motion, transition none. That's it. This is really, really nice. Inclusive design is not just for good, it's for good business, because the products will be better at the end and more people can use it. And let's come to the last topic then. Technical accessibility. So how do you browse the web? Or let's say, how do I browse the web? This is what I do. So I'm just looking around, scrolling, looking for paddings, looking for font sizes. The whole process is completely visually driven. I discover things that are bigger first. But then, there are also, then there's also assistive technology, right? So there are tools like JAWS, NVDA, or VoiceOver, which people use to get content read out loud. 
And fun fact about the people that use these kind of things, only 64% of these people are actually blind. Some people just like it to listen to stuff. Some people have to do something else. So it's not only about blind people here. So who, who knows how, how voiceover sounds? That's an accessibility mirror, yeah. <laughs> okay. Voiceover on Chrome. So we have now, okay. Development, window, link. The web performance group, link. Perf tooling today. Heading, heading level one. Hey, I'm Stefan. Heading level two. Log. He, 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 heading level two. Talks. Form. No items. Landmarks menu. List five items. Visited. Link. Home. List five items. Visited. Link. Home. Voiceover off. So what you just saw was that I was navigating with something that is called Area Landmark Roles. I jumped between proper headlines. So this is not only Zeo, right? And this shows that there is a technical side um, of accessibility. WebAIM, which stands for Web, Web Accessibility in Mind, and it is a nonprofit organization that deals with accessibility, they did in 2011 a check for common accessibility or technical accessibility errors in 2011. And they even excluded contrast errors. And they did the same thing last year. You see how we're doing? Well, and these errors are based on something that is called the WCAG or WCAG. So this is basically the spec for accessibility. And soon there will be WCAG 2.1, which um, is then an extension of this one. So what is written in this doc the document? Another topic that a lot of people smile about when, when I talk about that. Semantic markup. It took me two minutes and I found this kind of thing here, a Google Map widget. And I'm tabbing around a little bit and I can zoom in, I can zoom out. And the thing is that I cannot access the plus and minus with my keyboard. And why is that? This is the markup, typical diff soup. So how could we fix that now for a keyboard user? So well, maybe we can put a tab in next minus one on it. So this now becomes focusable on click, but not reachable by keyboard. So let's go with a zero instead. OK. But now assistive technology doesn't know that this is actually a button. So let's fix that. Roll button. OK. Now it will be announced as a button. But now a button has the things that you can press enter, or, and it, mar is a, it works as a click. So we can throw some JavaScript on it to make it work again. Or at the end, we can just use semantic markup and make things work initially. If you can use the web platform to solve issues, just use it. It's supported in more environments. Browser windows can optimize these things. Fewer code is better code. And I see still, so, and again, I see a lot of people smiling about semantic markup, but it's neither simple nor unimportant. Another big topic, focus handling. So I found a newspaper site and I started the journey in the search box. Do you see where I am when I'm tapping around? I didn't. And the three most evil lines of CSS. Are you ready? <laughs> Outline zero. And I'm doing front-end development now for seven years. And I quickly discovered, or I quickly had the opinion, never touch the outline. But actually, I changed that to always think of the outline. And why is that? I was reading an article about accessibility, and there was this comment below. There was a, a reader was claiming that the father of this reader had to switch browsers because the outline in Firefox was just not good enough. And when you think of that, the default outlines are maybe not good enough. So Firefox has this tiny dotted line. And funnily enough, the Chrome documentation with blue background do you see the blue Chrome outline when you're tabbing around in the documentation for Chrome? You don't. So you have to think of the outline. But why are people disabling the outline in the first place? The reason for that is this. Visual people hate that. I don't care, but <laughs> when you click this, the button, you get an outline. This is why people are disabling. And basically, there is a solution on its way. So we've got the focus ring spec upcoming with which we then can differentiate if this focus was triggered by a click or if this focus was triggered um, by the keyboard. This means that when you click it, you don't have to see the outline. There's a little thing here, though, 
there was really two weeks ago spec change. So now it's focus visible. Makes maybe a little bit more sense. There is a uh, polyfill for that that's in, in the spec. This is ready to use with the polyfill today. And Rob Dodson, who does a lot of accessibility things, he does something that is called Ellicasts. So check these videos, really, really nice. He also has an episode on Focus Ring, which is now Focus Visible. This is the content side. So how hard can it, for example, be to build an accessible model? And Rob Dodson from Google actually says this. The model is the boss battle in accessibility. And why is that? It's just display block and display none, isn't it? According to this uh, WCIG spec, an accessible model does the following things. It has its own tab sequence. It closes on escape. It focuses the first focusable element when opened, and it returns the focuses returns focus. Oh, there's a type focus. Oh, there's a typo. When it when it's closed. So let me show you an accessible model. It's not pretty, but it's accessible. So what you just saw was then the model opened, the focus went in, you could not tap out of it. Think of that, that there is a message that is like, hey, want to delete your account and you're just tabbing around, just doing something else. Well, maybe this can really break the user flow for someone. And it's bringing back the focus when you close it again. So how hard could it be to deal with focus today? It's so hard that people start building libraries around that. So what you see here is LIJS by Rodney Ram. And it turned out to make stuff inaccessible, which you have to do for all the other stuff when you open the modal, right? You have to do six things. Add tab index minus one to all the things. Treat focusable faults for SVG, remove controls from audio and video, override element focus, maybe some JavaScript is hanging around, add port events none, and are disabled. Easy. <laughs> Luckily, there is something on its way that will help us at some point, and it is called inert, with which we can remove stuff from the accessibility tree, and then we don't need something like that. So a model is nothing with co without content. So let's talk about content now. And let's look at the same blog post I already showed you. Voice over on Chrome. How I learned to love JavaScript. Window. Link. Image. Go to the profile of John Doe. Link. J follow. Button. Engineer. Drinking too much coffee. APR. One. One. Middle dot. Seven. Min read. Heading level one. How I learned to love JavaScript. Slash. One. Star H. One. P H. Eight. G B. Three. I. Seven. G P H. Five. H E. One. H I S Q dot P I G. Image. And brother I three slash. One. Heading level one. Two issues. Who heard both? So one is the image. <laughs> what is the issue? The dot. So the first one, there was this little thing in there. So there was a pseudo element hanging, and this had this middle element, right? So accessibility rules first. You should never put real content in pseudo elements. But just because you shouldn't put it there doesn't mean that it will, won't be picked up by um, assistive technology, right? Who is guilty of putting the multiplier x into uh, before or after? I did that for years. And this will be read out. So we can simply fix that and remove that um, for assistive technology using area hidden. Just because it's in CSS doesn't necessarily mean that it is hidden. And then we've got the image. Right? This is it. This bit maybe belongs into CSS in the first place, because I don't know which role Seattle plays in, a, in an article about code. So how could we remove an image element from the accessibility tree? Well, there are two ways. We could explicitly set an empty alt attribute, or we could set it role presentation, which then is just like, hey, just ignore that. That's, that's nothing. So with this, Voice over on Chrome. Oh, I learned to love JavaScript. Link. 
John Doe, follow, engineer, APR, 1, 7, mid read, heading level 1, when Brendan I created heading level 1, how I learned to love JavaScript, voice over off. Whoop, whoop. Um, so you should always set an proper, a proper alt text when you're dealing with images, right? But how hard could it actually be to write a proper alt text? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's actually harder than you think, and it highly depends on context. So I recommend this article here by WebAIM. It's really, really, really nice. So let's show me, let me show you another example here. How much value does that have? Here I'm looking at all the links and three of them are check out the project. Well, pfft, okay. It's the same with read more, more to discover, all these kind of tiny things that are behind shortened things. So what I had initially was that. So, and I could just simply fix that. I, I think it looks good visually, but I could do a better job for assistive technology by just using area label. But I now feel you already know I have to maintain another string here and then I have to do some things. Mm. You can also use area labeled by and, for example, connect it to a headline. And then everything works um, out of the box. And this is actually really sweet. And I personally think this is kind of geeking out on accessibility because now it's reading out something else than I see. That's super cool, I don't know. Um, so how hard could it be to, um, to create an accessible name? Leonie Watson, she is um, a, an accessibility consultant, wrote a really, really nice article, so check that out. So what I showed you so far was inconvenient for people using assistive technology. But let me show you a breaker, accessible updates. And let me show you um, our product. Did you hear that the save worked? Now let's think of, of um, me working in e-commerce, right? When you're doing Ajax add to cart or something. This is a breaker. This is people going somewhere else because they cannot put stuff into your cart. So what was this initially? It was just something that sl slid it down, published successfully. And the, there are these things that are called area life regions. So we could set a role of status and an area life. And then there are several levels, right? Maybe something, most likely something else is read out. Do you want to interrupt that? Maybe it's important, maybe it's not, right? So you can set different levels. And with something like that, the product actually becomes usable. Really, really cool. Um, Hayden Pickering is um, doing a lot of area and um, accessibility work, and he's working on this, inclusive components. He's really going into detail what it takes to, for example, build an accessible slider that works everywhere, or build a slideshow. So this is a perfect um, resource if you have to build your next component. But when dealing with area, make your markup solid first, right? Just don't throw area at everything, because sometimes you can more harm than it's good. So my friend Carl, who attended the Accessibility Club two years ago, he once said that he believes that making things accessible should be required because it's the right thing to do. And I had the same opinion, actually, for a while. But recently, this changed. Because at the end, man, I work in the front-end industry in Berlin. I make a good living. It's not the right thing to do, it's, and it's not doing favor. A big misconception is that accessibility is by, um, that by oh, adding accessibility, we're doing someone a favor. We're doing our job. We're making a lot of money. And governments agree. In the United States, there were 240 lawsuits in the US, mostly in retail, financial service, and hospitality. 
and all sites of the EU government have to be compliant with um, WCAG standards. Norway enforces every new site that goes out there to follow a given accessibility standard. Austria enforces accessibility standards for e-commerce since December 2016. Enforced accessibility standards are on their way. So you might ask yourself, okay, how can I meet these standards? There's this not so visually appealing document, but it's actually pretty good. But at the end, we have to remind ourselves that maybe it's not only about conversion. I think it's about being affordable, being inclusive, and being accessible. Because at the end, it's about people. And I want to build the best product possible, and I want it to be used by as many people as possible. And to achieve that, to build successful products, we have to think about these people. Because at the end, these products will be more successful. And always remind yourself that, depending on what products you build, for some people, an accessible internet literally makes a world of a difference. And that's it.